speaker view so you can see who's speaking directly on your screen. So I think we should begin. Everyone is here and we can start. Okay. Um, all right, so greetings everyone. Um, thank you for coming here today to our first online session. Um, this is the LSA panel on sexism, sexual harassment, and academia. Today's panel, the first one, is titled Complaint Work on the Importance of Naming the Issues and Testimony. My name is Ademide Adelusi Adeluye. I'll be your moderator today. Um, so to begin, sexual violence and predatory sexual behavior on campuses across Nigeria have recently been in the news. The panelists in this discussion will explore a range of issues affecting women in Nigerian higher education. Topics to be addressed include the passing of the sexual harassment bill by the Nigerian legislature, issues around diversifying higher education in Nigeria, the future of gender and feminist studies, and critical scholarship on gender and sexism in higher education in Nigeria and around the world. As many of us know, since its inception, the Lagos Studies Association has shown a strong commitment to addressing the problem of gender imbalances in the global academy. In 2019, this commitment was formalized through the founding of the LSA Women's Mentoring Network. At the inaugural meeting of this mentoring network at the LSA conference in 2019, we heard from panelists across generations about the experiences of institutional marginalization that female scholars faced, especially those who became mothers. But sexism and sexual violence are not only a Nigerian problem. The sexual and gender-based threats faced by women are endemic to academia internationally and are well documented. Moreover, sexism is a form of sexual violence experienced not just in academia, but in other fields as well. Women in each and every field, institution, organization, and community can and should organize as individuals and in communal frameworks to speak out and be heard and organize and be acknowledged. And we should acknowledge that this is the first step to addressing this problem. So the LSA as an academic organization, our focus, even though our focus is on universities increase, and increasing female representation at all levels, we also want to confront impediments to women's careers advancement. This round table, this, um, well, I was gonna say this morning, but it's not morning everywhere. This round table today aims to create a space to amplify discussions about marginalization and the silencing experienced by women in academia. This session will be the first online event hosted by the LSA Women's Mentoring Network, and we plan to convene more in the future. I want to say a special thank you to all our speakers who are being featured here today and to everyone who's been here. We hope that after everyone is able to speak for about five to seven minutes, then we can open it up for conversation. So I will go in alphabetical order. I'm going to introduce each speaker and then we'll allow them to speak. So our first speaker is Lola Akonde of University of Lagos. And to introduce her with her bio, Lola Akonde is an academic and writer. She earned her doctorate in English from the University of Ibadan. She currently teaches um, African literature in the Department of English at UNILAG. Her area of specialization is on literatures of the city. Her other interests include feminist activism, cultural studies, post-colonial studies, and literary theory. Akonde has a, ex conducted extensive research in representations of urban spaces in the African novel. Her new book, The City in the African Novel, a thematic rendering of urban spaces appeared in 2019 and it critically analyzes 16 African novels which she believes are representative of city trends. She has to her credit also three novels including the recent and award-winning What It Takes and Where Are You From? She has also recently published a collection, a collection of short stories, Sutas Escarts in Lagos. She mentors students in academic and creative writing. Welcome Lala Conde. We look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. So you can start. Oh, thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm told you have disabled participant um, screen sharing. Okay. Is this so? I will see if we can. <laughs> I'm unable to share my screen. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I'll see if I can fix that. It's supposed to work for you. Uh, I'm trying first. Okay, give me one second. Tell me that. Tell me that. 
просто для Can you let me in, please? I can't share my screen. Okay, one second. I'm going to try to fix that. It's supposed to be working, but I'm going to try to fix that now. Okay, please. Okay. Just give me one second. Okay, there. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Sexism and sexual harassment. Uh, this is my outline, content, introduction, scope and depth of sexism and sexual harassment, recent development, damages caused by sexism and sexual harassment, engagement with institutional responses, new insights, and conclusion. Introduction. There is systemic sexism in which the perpetrator may not be aware that they are perpetrating it. They may or they may not be aware until people call their attention to it. Sexual harassment is a many factor phenomenon. One of them is upbringing. How are boys brought up to see themselves? How are girls brought up to see themselves? How are girls brought up to see themselves? And how are boys brought up to see girls? University lecturers are practicing their art within the broad cultural and psychological context. Hence, they refer to women as bushmeat, roadkill, and a wolf. As far as they are concerned, these women are there for them, and it is not wrong for them to uh, perpetrate sexual harassment, scope and depth of sexual harassment and sexism. This has to do with power and power distribution. There are different kinds of power. Physical power, as in the cases of rape, abstract, philosophical, or intellectual power, which is blackmail of the most outrageous degree. All of these are at work in Nigerian tertiary institutions. And power breeds control. Control relates back to power. To have power, you must have control. And when you have control, this control cannot be effective unless and, on it, and until it is backed by power. So each needs the other. So at the end of the day, the woman is put in a sort of cage where the man is able to bring her out, use her whenever he wants, or do whatever it is that he wishes to do. So who has power? The professor in a tertiary institution has power. The project supervisor has power. The lecturer who grades exam scripts has power. The senior academics who determines who gets promotion, all of them have power. And this power is unaccountable. They have unaccountable power, which is illegal, and it is also immoral. The power of the professor over the student is a situation of asymmetrical relations because one is at the top, the other one is at the bottom. This breeds uh, involuntary, this generates involuntary obedience as subservience because the woman does not want to submit, the woman does not want to obey. She's being forced to do so. Recent development. There are daily reports of rape cases in Nigerian newspapers. It is very hard for anybody to open a Nigerian newspaper without seeing cases of rape. It is happening every day. Two days ago, a lecturer, two professors of the Imo State University were caught having sex or attempting to have sex with female students who had reported them to the police. One of the cases is very pathetic. The, the, the female student begged the professor to accept money and the professor asked her to pay 150,000 Naira. She paid the money, the professor accepted the money, and after taking the money, he insisted that he must sleep with her. It was at this point that the student informed the police. Now, the university says they have set up uh, a committee to investigate. Also, two days ago, a book 
became a center of discussion at the Obafemi, Obafemi Awolowo University in Leifel, written by Olusia Gunadeni. The title of the book is Naked Abuse, Finding Safe Spaces for uh, Female Students in Nigeria in African Universities. These are some of the recent developments in Nigeria. But what all of this tell us is that this problem is huge, this problem is serious, and enough is not being done you know, to address the problem. So what are the damages caused by sexism and sexual harassment? The impact is very shattering. Women that pass through this process hate themselves and they also hate perpetrators. Sex, sexism and sexual harassment breeds corruption, incompetence, because the unqualified get what they do not deserve. It leads to collapse of the system because it breeds injustice. It breeds immorality, partiality. This is, ex, uh, the, the, for example, this is uh, Funto Yewale's experience in what it takes, which is a story of how to kill a system. Sexism and sexual harassment kill the system because the best, do, the best people do not get the best opportunities. Now engaging with institutional responses. Well, they, they, all the universities in Nigeria proclaim that they have zero tolerance for sexual harassment. For instance, when it happened in Unilag, they quickly set up a pro panel on sexual harassment. Until today, we, are not, we have not been given the report. So sexism and sexual harassment has become normalized in Nigeria's higher institutions. And when they make these proclamations, they do not, they are not sincere about it. When they set up committees to investigate, most times reports are not produced. Sometimes when reports are produced, the reports that emerge eventually are pushed aside. Nobody is interested. They are not sincere. So what do we do? What can we do? How do we solve this problem? We need to emphasize gender reckoning. There should be constant seminars and symposia on sexism and sexual harassment. People should be brought to campuses to discuss, prominent women, former victims, men of good conscience. And additionally, it is important to raise conscientization you know, amongst the populace, especially amongst men, and also amongst women who are victims and who are potential victims. It must begin from the top, from the, top, from the, um, the vice chancellor. Now, one of the recent developments, which we may say is good, is the proclamation by the Kaduna State House of Assembly two days ago that there's a law that has just been passed, that a, a bill has just been passed into law two days ago that any man caught raping a woman in Kaduna will now be castrated. We don't know how sincere this is going to be and it is yet to be seen. New insights. We need to take the problem more seriously. We need to put it more, put it more into public discussion. We need to remove the secrecy surrounding sex it is one of the factors aiding sexism and sexual harassment. We should be able to mention sexual organs by their proper names. We should remove the taboos and abominations so that victims can come out. It is because of the secrecy surrounding sex. That's why women don't often come out. And because eventually they find ways to punish the women that come out. Conclusion. Nigerian universities do not take the issue of, of uh, sexual harassment and sexism seriously. This is because the African culture is very permissive. It is a normal thing. Women, as far as they are concerned in African culture, are bushmeat. They are roadkill. They are wolf. So they don't take this issue seriously. And oftentimes, when they talk about it, they are doing so for the cameras. So it is a challenge to be a woman in the Nigerian tertiary institution. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Lola, for your um, um, for your talk. So we're going to take all the speakers and then we're going to open it up to questions in the interest of time. All right. Our next speaker is Judy Byfield. Um, Dr. Byfield is originally from Jamaica and is a professor in the Department of History at Cornell University. She's a member of the graduate field in feminist, gender and sexuality and Africana studies. And Byfield's focus is primarily on African and Caribbean history. She's the author of The Great Upheaval, Women and the Nation in Post-War Nigeria, 
this 2020, and The Bluest Hands, A Social and Economic History of Women Indigo Dyers in Western Nigeria, 1890 to 1940. Her current research project, Curry Goats and Gary, West Indian Women in 20th Century Lagosian Society, focuses on English-speaking Caribbean women who migrated to Nigeria as wives of Nigerian men. She was the co-chair of the program committee for the 17th Berkshire Conference on the History of Women, Genders, and Sexuality in 2017, is also a former president of the African Studies Association, as well as the chair of the Association of African Studies Programs from 2002 to 2005. Welcome, Professor Byfield. I will mute myself and start the timer. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and it's good to see so many people here um, for us this morning, <laughs> for you this afternoon. Um, so I thought I'd start a little bit by sort of sharing some of my own experiences with um, coming of age at the time that I did, because certainly as much as the US um, and the West in general, um, you know, talk about the, um, the, the opportunities for women in, in the space, we know that it didn't always exist that way. When I started um, high school in the 70s, it was an ice, a high school that had been all boys. And the, when I got there in um, the year in 73, the first co-ed class graduated that year. So in classes, I was often the only girl. Um, and so I had to sort of get over my own shyness and learn to speak out when I was very outnumbered in classes. The same thing happened when I went to college. The first co-ed class and co-ed recruited class, I should say, graduated the year I got there. And there was a quota on the number of women. It was three to one men to women. Um, the young men were still very upset that women were allowed. And so um, they would, share their upset with us, they would tell us that we were not wanted. Um, uh, it was also the time when there was an expansion in the numbers of black students and other students of color in higher education. And so black women were caught in this vice where we weren't wanted because we were women and we were additionally unwanted because we were black women. Um, it was also at the time when women's studies programs were just being launched in different universities. Um, and so there, in fact, at Dartmouth College where I was, the name they gave to all of these programs that were built around communities that were historically left out. So the women's studies program, the Native American studies program, the black studies program, um, we were called victim studies programs. And the, the sort of, um, you know, uh, disregard imposed on us was actually quite generic. It wasn't restricted to the students. There were also faculty members who didn't care to see these programs in place. Um, and there were alumni. And some alumni actually stopped contributing money to the school because they had created all of these programs. But the reality meant though that we still had to figure out how to survive in these spaces when so many people were vocal about not wanting us there. And for me, the fact that we had a Black Studies program made all the difference because it was the space where I actually worked in the office. Um, my advisor was a literary professor and um, he encouraged me to just do the work I was interested in. In fact, when I went to him and said I couldn't figure out what to major in, he said, major in what you like. 
And I said, okay, I like education and I like black studies. And so I had to create my own major and he guided me through the process. And I actually did um, um, an undergraduate long research project on black women writers um, and, you know, Toni Morrison, Gail Naylor, just a whole slew of people whose books were coming out at the time. And so even within that hostile environment, having spaces um, where as a black woman, I was validated, it still enabled me to make it through that institution. And then of course, when I went to grad school, um, being in New York was a different experience, but once again, having support systems made a tremendous difference. It was in grad school, however, where I first experienced sexual assault, and I was assaulted my first year in graduate school in New York, and I was also assaulted during my first trip to Nigeria in 1985. Um, I shared that with my friends, and it, they helped me um, stay in school because for a while I definitely did not want to remain. Um, they also helped me go back to Nigeria. It was decades before I could plan a trip to Nigeria and not have a panic attack. Um, the family I lived with in Nigeria were incredible. Um, they stood by my side. They took me to see a doctor who, in his wisdom, told me next time I should lie back and enjoy the experience. And so, one, he obviously did not remember his code as a doctor, um, but it was an example of, again, just how ubiquitous this was that he was not at all surprised. And, you know, with the idea that, yeah, and it was likely to happen again. Um, fortunate for, fortunately for me, it didn't. But that experience um, was something that ultimately I needed professional help. Uh, or those experiences, I needed professional help um, to sort of keep my life on track um, and to keep my career on track. Um, I knew I had a good topic in what I was working on in Nigeria, and I wasn't going to allow that experience to prevent me from going back to Nigeria, but it was at a cost. Um, I think it's important that this bill um, has been discussed as being passed, but I'm also struck by what's lacking. There is a little pat on the back that they give themselves for acknowledging that it's not only men who commit sexual harassment, that women may also, and there are some women who do harass, um, but there is no mention at all that sexual harassment can also happen within same-sex contexts. And so, um, the bill only references harassment in terms of homosexuality. The other thing for me, of course, is that um, there isn't what I can see as sort of a mechanism to a more fundamental and fuller um, space and opportunities for resources for there to be a much broader discussion about this. As our first speaker said, this is not unique um, to universities. It's not unique to Nigeria, but um, it's good that it's opening up here, but there needs to be investment in resources to actually um, assist young men and young women who have been sexually harassed. Or, um, harassed. The resources have to be, um, there can be peer to peer assistance. My friends who helped me through those experiences are still the people who help me through day to day things now. But it can't rest only at the level of interested friends. We have to have access to professionals 
who are trained in helping people um, recover their lives. Sexual assault and harassment is a form of trauma. And we have to be able to acknowledge and help people work through the trauma. As our first speaker said too, um, uh, Lola, is that it can't be a conversation only among, among women. It has to be a conversation that involves men and women. And it has to be a conversation that um, where we examine critically the way we are socialized to think about gender roles and expectations and about sexuality and about our control of our own individual bodies. That was the thing that actually struck me most about my own experiences. I said no. I fought and I lost. It never occurred to me I would have to wrestle someone to protect my bodily integrity. The other important thing too is that it can't start at university. It has to be throughout the, the society. It has to be frankly in elementary school. We have to make the conversations appropriate for different age groups, but we have to begin those conversations where young people are taught to recognize what is inappropriate attention versus what is appropriate attention. And the conversations have to go on throughout um, secondary school by the time you get to college. Um, one of the reasons I think that it's so important to have these institutions in place um, not only for the conversations to happen, but for the help when it happens is because as you know, you can go on to have accomplished lives, you can go on to be very successful, but you never know when you're going to have a flashback. It sneaks up on you. When I was chair of women's and gender studies, at Dartmouth College. I tried to be there for all the students. I would go to all their um, thesis presentations. And yet there was one presentation one year where it was talking about, you know, people in the U.S. will know um, SU, Law and Order SUV Special Victims Unit and, and um, the student did this wonderful content analysis of the series. I literally fell apart in her talk. And luckily I was sitting at the back of the room so I could escape without people seeing me. And I went to my friend's office and just sobbed. Um, more recently, when um, the discussions were going on about Justice Kavanaugh, I couldn't listen to them. And I was on Facebook with other friends who had had similar experiences, and we all talked about the fact that that had been a tremendously triggering experience for all of us. So the trauma of the experience stays with you for decades. Um, and it's important that young men um, that boys and girls, young women see that you can go on to have a life and a career and family and you will continue to have moments of happiness. But there are going to be those triggers that take you right back into those experiences. And we need to have those places everywhere, whether in school, in church, um, at our jobs where you can go and get that assistant at that moment where you can pull yourself together and go back into face, whether it's your students or your colleagues or anything. So um, I don't know what I will be like later today, but I thought it was important for me to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Byfield, and your generosity and your openness. Thank you for sharing with us. Something I didn't say at the beginning is how difficult this conversation will likely be for those who are speaking and also those who are participating. And I hope we can all, you know, come together and 
you know, work through this in a way that's respectful to all our speakers and all our listeners. So thank you again. Um, okay. Um, next, we have Dr. Bosade George, who is a professor of history at um, Barnard College and Columbia University in New York City. She's the author of Making Girls, a history of girlhood, labor, and social development in colonial Lagos, along with numerous articles on uh, different issues. She's also a founding member of the Lagos Studies Association and also serves on the board. Thank you, Dr. Abbasideh. We look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thank you to the speakers who went before me. Um, such a great opening, Dr. Akande, and um, such a profound reflection, um, Professor Byfield. My, my remarks are going to be responding to the prompt we were given. Uh, we know that this is a series of panels this weekend and next weekend. And today we're focusing on the importance of naming the issues and uh, testimony, doing the necessary complaint work, as, um, as, as Sabah Mahmoud called it. And next week, we're going to focus more on what can be done. So uh, I'm going to focus on that first part, like what, what the issues are. Um, I'm also going to try to, well, I'll just, I'll just launch into it. So, so I was thinking of several things um, as I was trying to prepare my remarks. I have to admit that I have um, been aware of the, the film, the expose that was um, aired by BBC and that was done by those brave uh, young journalists. But it took me a really long time to watch it. And um, instead I was following the commentary, I got the gist. So then the sexual harassment bill came out and we, and that prompted a whole new round of discussion about the reactiveness of some of our institutions about whether this was even original, given the long standing decades of research and recommendations, reports, uh, demands that have surrounded this issue of sexual harassment in higher education in African universities in general, including Nigerian universities. So yes, this new bill is important, it does something, Yes, this new bill is reactive. It didn't do anything until, it didn't exist until the expose went viral in uh, social media, getting millions of views. Um, so, and yes, we're, we're here kind of obliquely talking about it. Um, so I was thinking about that, I was thinking about the expose, thinking about this bill thinking about um, the scope of the problems of sexual harassment, but also secondarily, and I think perhaps more pervasive even, the scope and the various forms that sexist discrimination can also take. So there's sexual harassment, which um, is an egregious expression of a general culture of lawlessness, impunity, entitlement, manipulation, dehumanization, just a general culture of corruption. Um, Charmaine Pereira, one of the, the speakers today, has actually written an article linking um, the phenomenon of sexual harassment on campuses, in workplaces, with the general culture of corruption and impunity and lawlessness in the general society. So this is not a new idea. Um, but sexual harassment is this kind of egregious expression of it. It is a, um, it is a kind of a, a violation of the body. And, you know, it is this phenomenon where, you know, perpetrators are ready to see their targets as personal conquests or objects of uh, sexual conquest, etc. cetera. Um, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that perpetrators 
of sexual harassment also are likely to be perpetrators of all many kinds of uh, violations, many kinds of um, many kinds of other forms of violations against people who they see as subordinate or junior to them. Um, so a perpetrator of sexual harassment would be likely to see their students as uh, personal secretaries, as errand boys, errand girls, free labor, whatever. Right? So it's, a, it's usually a complex, a complex of issues of which sexual harassment is one of the manifestations of their deep-seated um, form of corruption. Um, but sexism, I think, also is something that I want to talk about. Um, and this is another kind of poison, a related poison, that um, infects uh, academic cultures, one that is more pervasive and takes many forms. Um, both of these poisons, sexual harassment and sexist discrimination, ha are, have a broad, can have a broad um, range of targets, broad scope of targets. We're talking about undergraduates, you know, the, the most junior students, postgraduate students, junior staff, you know, people perceived to be junior staff. When I was visiting at Unilag um, four years ago, several years ago, yeah, I say four years ago, I remember I was walking in a hallway, I was looking for something, so I looked like I was kind of lost and looking for something. And I remember that um, someone was trying to invite me into his office, a man I did not know at all, and um, was trying to encourage me to come into his office. Didn't really kind of um, know me, we'd never met before. It wasn't a colleague that I talked to before. So um, I assumed, you know, I was a bit younger then, I assumed that it was just the perception that I might be someone junior to them that makes you a target. Um, visiting researchers, as we just heard, can be targets, postdocs, all kinds of people are um, considered, can, can find themselves being targeted for sexual harassment and for sexist discrimination. Um, one of the things I want us to think about with um, the issue of sexist discrimination is, and maybe sexist discrimination in, in higher education in Nigeria, in higher education in African universities, and maybe in higher education more broadly, although the problems are less in different parts of the world. Um, so one thing is the, the relationship between students and supervisors, a very personal one, and um, one that can make a, the junior person um, quite vulnerable in various ways. Um, junior people are often made to kind of ingratiate themselves and we see egregious examples of this uh, in Nigeria, people ingratiating themselves in very public ways by, by honoring their supervisors every other day, et cetera. So, so this relationship between the supervisor and the student is structurally a very close one, a very dependent one, a very personal one. And um, with the right supervisor, it can be very functional and very supportive. The wrong supervisor, it can be very exploitative. Um, and what does this look like um, when the junior person is a woman with a uh, male supervisor? So I want to think about that dynamic. Not only is it a power differential, but it's also this enforced intimacy, it's enforced closeness. You're in a close relationship to someone who you're in a very hierarchical uh, relationship with, too. Um, you know, other forms of um, sexist, sexism or sex exploitation, you know, when you find um, young people or junior scholars um, having their, um, their work be um, 
basically robbed, stolen by, by more senior people. You can have that phenomenon where that intimacy of working together can result in your ideas being taken, um, your, you know, your, your uh, being assigned credits for co-authoring or co-editing, things that you may be 100% responsible for. These are based on cases that I've heard of uh, from many people. Um, you know, um, the phenomenon of the, of the closed door, of the closed door meeting where um, young people, junior scholars can find themselves um, being, being addressed on their appearance, how you look, how you smell, you know, all of these, all of these unrelated, unrelated issues um, that are kind of brought to bear in your, in your, in your dynamic with this supervisor, with someone in a supervisory role, even before you get to being able to express your ideas about the work itself, um, if that. Um, and all of this, I think, has implications for knowledge production down the road for innovation. Um, some, as we just heard, one is, it's not impossible to somehow continue and build a career, build an intellectual life, um, despite being exposed to these forms of exploitation uh, based on your sex, you know, either, whether it's sexual harassment or the other forms of sexist discrimination. It's not impossible, but it is a, it is a tall order. It is an extraordinary standard to be uh, put in front of a young scholar who was trying to kind of join the community of um, researchers and intellectuals and make their contribution, their own mark in, at, the, at some point to, to the library of what we know um, um, as about Africa. So, so it's a tall order and it is a disp one disproportionately um, disproportionately demanded of uh, young, younger uh, female scholars. And one that not everybody can be expected to meet, right? Not everyone can be expected to meet those challenges. We've heard about the, the paucity of institutional resources, medical resources, um, psycho-emotional resources, financial resources, the paucity of resources for people who are targeted to be able to regroup, rebuild, to get redress, right? So it's a tall order to, um, for, for young people who are effectively, generally abandoned to figure it out on their own. Um, another thing to think about is I know it's a bit all over the place, but another thing I was thinking about is what happens, you know, to those who, um, you know, there, there, there are definite costs to playing the game, playing the, the, the sexual game, the sexual dance, the flirtatious game, the, um, the teasing game, or to, to kind of playing along in order to navigate through this, um, through this obstacle course, right, of sexual harassment and sexism that you're confronting on a daily basis. But what happens if you don't play the game, right? What happens if you resist? In various ways, you may resist physically if it's a physical attack of sexual harassment, sexual assault. Um, you may resist by, you know, maybe you don't laugh at the jokes. Maybe you don't find things funny. Maybe you're the dry one. Maybe you're the one who has, um, you know, who, who doesn't, is not interested in seeing um, young female students hired to be cute and act as ushers at a conference. Uh, maybe you're the one who raises a, pro a, a comment or a critical comment about um, a policy, a, maybe a toothless policy. Maybe you're the one who's, who's just always kind of actually 
being critical and demanding, demanding more. So what happens if you don't play the game in those kinds of ways? Um, what if you don't want to play the game with someone who, uh, with a scholar who has a great reputation? You know, the person is considered to be a, you know, very respected and esteemed and what a great teacher and has supported so many people, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and you have a, another truth to tell about that same individual. So what kinds of, what happens to, to a, a person who has a completely different lens on, on the hero, right? The hero figure in, in a department or in a field um, in academia. Um, you know, this for the, you know, retaliation is one thing that can happen. You know, we've already heard about um, students being retaliated against for resisting, for speaking out, for being critical of their um, harassers. Um, you know, junior faculty, junior lecturers, um, scholars who are in a more vulnerable stage or more vulnerable position, they can be retaliated against for not playing the game as well, or for speaking out, um, retaliated against in terms of professional opportunities being refused to them, um, their ideas being overlooked, promotions, etc. So in different ways being stifled. Um, you know, this plays out, you know, they can, they can be denied letters of recommendation, grants, funding, the various ways in which retaliation, many forms that it can take in a very hierarchical academic culture, um, which is a guild-like system where we really rely on references and who knows who um, in order to, to uh, in order to really kind of um, reach conclusions about merit, you know. Um, and the peculiar thing about academic life is that, about, being, about academia is that what we do is not just, um, you know, being an academic is not just a job, it's kind of a lifestyle. So um, the, the impacts of retaliation are, um, may not only affect your, your job, so to speak, your work space quality, but your life quality, work life quality in general. Your housing may be affected, your healthcare may be affected, your children's schooling, all kinds of things um, maybe are bound up often in our, our jobs and, and connected. Um, you know, as I said, there, there's been research, despite, you know, the University of Lagos only coming up with a, a robust sexual harassment policy last year. There's been research on sexual harassment in African universities and including Nigerian universities since the 90s at least. So it's not always the case that we have to only rely on internal university policies in order to have information. This, the, the topic of sexual harassment and the topic of sexism and sexist discrimination in academia is also a research area like this is these are fields of scholarship that have many scholars working within those areas already so they're not like just the person on the committee writing the report they're people who have written books and many articles and we're fortunate to have some of them on here um and this is a robust and very important research area with direct application to the academic, academic world. But um, those researchers too can face retaliation simply for working in that kind of field, simply for working on a topic that challenges uh, many of their colleagues. Um, I've been given the one minute notice and I'm not even sure when I was given that. So I'm going to wrap up. Um, but I just want to wrap up by, with a quick comment about effects. Um, some of the obvious effects are that, you know, the culture of impunity, corruption, objectification, exploitation 
um, has the effect of, you know, tamping down on the range of ideas that we have coming into the academy, um, tamping down on the brilliance of students who came in wanting to explore, you know, the world of research. And by the time they've experienced these traumas, they may not be able to go on and one cannot actually even blame them. Um, you know, one thing to think about is multi-generational transfer. This is not the first generation of students that has experienced this kind of thing. So, you know, what happened to the students from earlier generations? Um, what kind of support were they able to pass on or unable to pass on because of their own experience? Some of them are in the academy themselves, some of our senior women colleagues. And um, what is the impact of this kind of multi-generational um, um, experience of trauma um, within this kind of the female gendered side of the academy? So, you know, what, these are the things that I'm thinking about and they're not entirely uh, coherent, but I'm going to wrap up and to wait for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. George. Okay, so we're gonna move ahead speedily. Our next speaker is Taibat Lawrenson from University of Lagos. Dr. Lawrenson is Associate Professor of Urban Planning and Co-Director of the Center of Housing and Sustainable Development at the University of Lagos, Nigeria. Her research interests are in the broad areas of urban informality, pro-poor development, governance, and environmental justice. She's particularly interested in how formal and informal systems synthesize in emerging African urban contexts. Thank you, Dr. Lawrenson. I'm unmuting now. All right, thank you, Ademide, and hello, everybody. Um, it is a wet afternoon in Lagos, and um, if my voice is not clear, please let me know so that I can disable the video for better bandwidth. So I'm going to start by saying that the Academy to All Intents and Purposes is the boys club. And this is global because what you see, you read up on social media, on Twitter, about some of the systemic harassment that women face in the academy generally. This is exacerbated in Nigeria because of our social construct, which is essentially patriarchal and consideration for women is often neglected and or forgotten. And so in the universities, oftentimes our colleagues don't mean to do harm. They just forget that, you know, it's their women and their, their, their considerations need to be um, taken as well. And so I will speak as somebody who is a product of the Nigerian educational system and has been teaching in a Nigerian university for the past 22 years. The power dynamics are very strong and uneven. And oftentimes many of the senior academics take on due advantage of this. Oftentimes when you see a female student being very obsequious and um, you know, very subservient to the male senior lecturer, often enforcing the in local parents, calling them daddy and uncle and all of that. It is because they want to avoid, they, they want to make themselves smaller and avoid the man seeing them, you know, as a woman, but more of as a child that should not be abused. And so many of our um, undergrads and younger academics have, have um, adopted you know, this style, have adopted this style. And then, you know, even the, the female academics, I have been you know, a victim of this, you get passed up for opportunities and it's all in a day's job. You hear things like, um, Oh, you, you can't go for the, you can't represent the department for this event because you have a baby to take care of. Meanwhile, your colleague who ends up going has a baby much younger than you, yours, but well, it's a woman's responsibility to take care of a baby and it is, you know, taken as, you know, one, a negative tick, 
you know, when it comes to responsibilities and things like that. So you have to deal with it. Oftentimes in asserting your rights, you're seen as being aggressive and, um, or, you know, your assertiveness rubs off on the wrong way. And then we have these issues of systemic um, harassment, where alluding back to what Dr. Lola said, how we raise our boys and how we raise our girls and their um, sense of awareness and respect. So a lot of inappropriate language that goes on in the classrooms, a lot of inappropriate um, um, engagement, verbal communications between lecturers and students is often because the lecturer doesn't know better by virtue of upbringing. When I was head of department, you know, we've had cases like that. And when we raised it, the person didn't even know that, you know, what he was, the, the, the jokes and sexual innuendos were improper for a classroom setting or for communicating with somebody that was that, you know, eons away from you. So sometimes it's a question of orientation and reorientation. And we've had, you know, implications. Many of our younger female um, students tend to change their area of interest. If you know that there's a predator, oftentimes you choose to, you know, chart another pathway, which is a disservice to the academy. I've had cases of students deferring courses because particular people were teaching those courses and saying, I'll take it next year when it's allocated to somebody else. And then there's the fear. You find out that students that have genuine concerns are unable to go to, uh, you know, raise those concerns or have them addressed because they are afraid to go into a lecturer's office alone or they are afraid to go, you know, because there's the potential to be abused or harassed or propositioned. And then there's an increased pressure on the female lecturers to be mediators. Oftentimes the students come to the female lecturers who may or may not have, you know, um, may not be able to take decisions. But thankfully, at least in the University of Lagos, to a large um, extent, the female lecturers help to shield some of these abuse where they can. And then some of them are gatekeepers as well, you know, sometimes for cultural reasons, which goes back to the issue of how are we raising our boys and how are we raising our girls. But it's important to say that wherever we are in the academy, particularly for us women, we need to protect our own. At every stage, they may be on the ladder. And one way we can do that is to open up opportunities for women. If there's an opportunity and there's a, there's a qualified um, woman that can take it, by all means and purposes, we should push you know, the, the women there. And then I want to say a bit about you know, the institutional framework. University of Lagos has been proactive about you know, supporting um, institutional policy. The former VC, Professor Bello, actually made his um, email address open and so you could bypass all the processes if you felt unsafe or harassed and he will take it up. There have been cases where he took personal interest because the student reached out to him directly. Professor Gundikpe has the same um, open door policy. You don't have to go through any long process if you feel unsafe or unheard of. The, that is apart from you know, the regular processes in the university through the student affairs, through the counseling. There is a university counseling committee that takes care of those who need um, professional help. I've served on that committee and it has been in existence for at least from 2009. And it has helped you know, students who have had you know, issues around sexual harassment, mental health and all of that. It may not be as strong as it ought to be because not um, usually it is people are get referred to the committee. There, there are few cases of people just walking in and that is because it is not the, the it is not as well known. So the communication process of how to seek for a safe space or how to seek, you know, for care needs also to, to be strengthened. The university sexual harassment policy, like um, Abosedi said, came up last year, and that was prior to the BBC interview. And since then, there have been some steps taken at the university level. There's a harassment committee at the faculty level where people 
can report. And I must say that sexual harassment is not the only challenge that we have. There are other forms of harassment, particularly financial. You hear some really, really ridiculous things, and it just shows that it's a question of power, power drunkenness. Either it's um, demanding sex or demanding um, financial reward for whatever the case may be. People just um, like to take unnecessary advantage of those they feel they have more power over. And um, as Professor Byfield said, the orientation of how to do better must start, cannot start with the university. It must start from the very foundation. And um, I know the private schools in Nigeria are doing, you know, doing that, but um, very few children attend the private school. So if it's going to go across the board, then it must be a statewide um, policy and it must go beyond just the textbook um, situation to having a full orientation where children are self-aware and knowledgeable about intent, consent, you know, and boundaries. And um, interestingly, um, a lot of the um, rise in um, martial arts education is a direct consequence or is a direct response, particularly for girls, to this. You must be able to protect yourself, even if it is um, physically. And um, finally, I'll talk about the sexual harassment um, bill at the National Assembly. I think it is fundamentally flawed because. Um, the university has autonomy and university policies should guide activities within the university. We also have the criminal um, procedure with the police and the courts in the city, and they cover issues of sexual harassment, rape, and all of that. What I believe should be done is to strengthen those enforcement um, arms, strengthen the power of the police and the court, and the courts to effectively prosecute perpetrators rather than setting up this new bill that um, raises arguments of autonomy and distracts us from the issue of actually protecting you know, those who are victims. And so what do we do? We need to create safe spaces for victims to report and also create spaces for them to continue to thrive after reporting. It's not enough for you to report. Justice must be done. And then you know, minimal harm must be done to the person who um, reports. And then we need to enforce you know, those laws. And then there's need for serious orientation and reorientation, particularly for those who think it's just a joke. And finally, I think the conversation needs to center around those with less power. When the BBC documentary came out, a lot of our colleagues you know, had opinions, different opinions. So the girl was harassing was harassing the man. What did the girl go to do in the man's office? Oh, there are girls who proposition um, um, lecturers and things like that. But the important thing that we need to do is that at every point in time, when harm is done, we need to center the, converse, the conversation around those to whom that harm has been done and find a way to do better um, across the board. So I stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lawrenson. All right, so moving to our next speaker, um, Mojibalu Olufunke Okome is an international political economist whose regional specialization is on the African continent. She was educated at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, Long Island University in New York, and Columbia University in New York. And she's a professor of political science at Brooklyn College in CUNY. She's the past women's, study, women's studies program director and past deputy chair for graduate studies in the Department of Political Science at Brooklyn College. Born in Nigeria, Mujibalu has worked on international development issues as a consultant for clients, including the United Nations and Commonwealth Secretariat in London. Her research interests include youth empowerment, gender, democracy and citizenship in Africa, governance, de um, governance, development and democracy in Africa, effects of globalization, post-colonialism, and modernity on economic and political transformation in African diaspora studies. She has a very long list of impressive publications and is also the founder of Bring Back Our Girls NYC. Thank you, Professor Okome. Thank you very much. Well, you know, um, I think I want to go um, to the words sexual harassment because they're misleading 
what occurs includes sexual harassment, sexual assault, rape, you know, and a whole lot of egregious predatory behavior. Um, so it involves the use of words that target people with kind of fallacious sexual intent and action touching people who don't want you to touch them um, and punitive behavior punishing people who do not submit to the desire of the um, you know perpetrator and impunity now i also want to say there's nothing about african culture that legitimates sexual assault rape you know predatory behavior but you know people who have power have told us that this is part of the behavior that is legitimated i know this because i grew up in nigeria in a nigerian family and sexual assault sexual you know sexually predatory behavior is condemned it's not that it's not done it is condemned and it's not part of the culture you know so let's throw that out the window and challenge the people who want to make this um, an accepted thing because this is what we've been doing uh, from tiny memorial so to whom does the university belong somebody said it's a men's club and that's not just in nigeria it is actually here in these united states too and everywhere in the world because the way we organize academic work the life of the mind can you know is best available to men because women have to juggle multiple responsibilities and when you are in academic space as a woman you are made to feel like you know you have to get with the program and do what the powerful people want you to do most of the powerful are men um, whether it's here or in nigeria i went to school in nigeria i went to university in nigeria and um, to whom the uni does the university belong became a thing for me because in my second year a professor actually harassed me it was words <laughs> and I pushed back and um, as a result of pushing back and also um, somebody advised me that I should get somebody other professors to talk to him so that he wouldn't fail me and I did so I got the uh, lowest of the pass marks in his course and it affected my GPA but I didn't mind because I was able to speak and confront him you know and he was surprised and shocked. Now, let me also say that it's not just my experience that I'm kind of um, thinking about. Uh, University of Lagos is doing some things, but there's a lot that needs to be done. You know, I don't think any of us should um, try to, um, to, to, to um, make palatable the efforts of our institutions. Even Brooklyn College, where I work, students who are harassed with all the measures that are put in place in order to get justice, you have to be tenacious. You have to have people who are powerful back you. Sometimes those people sell you out. So, you know, don't let think that because there are laws and rules and, you know, there's open discussion that people get justice. It doesn't always happen. And I'm saying this from knowing the experience of a particular student who came to me and all kinds of promises were made by the Title IX people that they didn't keep, okay, at Brooklyn College. So, um, safety and security is important in the universities. Clearly, it's men's safety and security that's important. They're the ones that should feel comfortable in these spaces. That's why they feel sometimes that they can act with impunity because nobody is going to really call them to order. The guy who was harassing students at Brooklyn College was an adjunct faculty and well, they didn't rehire him. So he can go and do that in other places, but not at Brooklyn College. And the student who, who complained was actually penalized because she got a lower grade out of the whole thing, you know. So 
my experience, like uh, how many years ago, um, a century ago in Nigeria is being replayed at Brooklyn College. And I don't think it is that unusual. You see in academic um, um, communities where people have said, economists have come out and said they're these senior scholars who extract sex in exchange for them giving the publication um, outlets to the most prestigious places and stuff like that. So let us be clear, this is a worldwide problem. Me too is not just a Nigerian phenomenon. It's just making baby steps in Nigeria anyway. Um, then who is the citizen of the university? Also, it's supposed to be the men. Oh, they don't know what they are doing. Are they, are they, are they, are they, are they? It's either they are idiots, which I don't think is the case, or they are, um, I mean, you cannot be an adult and really with a straight face claim that you don't know when you are saying something that makes somebody else uncomfortable because you can read their body language. And then the sexual assault part, what part of that don't people know is wrong? So it is not about how you know, um, oh, they don't know, uh, they were made aware, and now they are apologetic, they are lying. And let's call them on that. Um, what must be done? I think the responsibility of the institution is clear. Do you want to make safe spaces, really? The safe spaces cannot be in individual professors' gatherings because they are compassionate. It has to be the whole university. People should be able to walk around there, own the space, do their work, be respected, be honored, be nurtured without being afraid of being, you know, preyed upon. And I also want to say that, you know, uh, women have to take back their power. Sometimes taking back your power entails that you're going to, to suffer, you know, um, <laughs> punitive um, attempts by people. There are a lot of people that I know who would not recommend me for anything because I've spoken very clearly to them about their bad behavior and I'm ready to take the cost of that. Sometimes, you know, if, you're, if, if you feel the need and you have good friends, you can build coalitions to fight this, but the onus should not be on the victims and survivors. The onus is on these institutions. And if they are willing to really do the, the right thing, you know, we would have seen the change. I have been in several Nigerian universities. There's one, I won't name it, um, where we were having very cordial <laughs> discussions about me, them hosting me for a fellowship. And then I said, I've heard rumors about you guys that here in this university, there's a lot of sexual harassment. And you know, I want you to know when I'm here, I'm not gonna have it. I'm going to fight whoever. They assured me that wasn't the case, oh, they are good guys, whatever. But the discussions about hosting me crashed to a halt. Okay? Um, I was also at another university where students were making complaints about these professors. They called them a um, cabal of professors who extorted sex for grades. And these students were not, they were making anonymous um, complaints. The university said they don't respond to anonymous complaints. Now, if you cannot make it safe for the students to guarantee them that they would not be victimized, why would they want to come forward? You know, so I think a lot of our universities are very hypocritical. And, you know, in terms of whatever laws are passed in Nigeria and whatever regulations are in place, implementation is key. To what extent are we serious about implementing all these measures? in a way that makes the citizenship of universities open to all, male, female, transgendered, and everybody, you know, because in Nigeria, you know, when it's actually same sex predatory behavior, there's no space to discuss it because we have decided to make that an illegitimate kind of status. So I think I'm out of time. I'm going to stop. I would be very, very happy to answer questions but I'm tired of hypocrisy, you know? So I think we should call this thing as we see it. There's too much bad behavior. It's legitimized because majority of us would rather keep people um, safe and secure or, you know, the systems that we are in, we don't want to crash the system 
some of these systems really need to be shaken up and women need to take back their power. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. So moving quickly, our next, speak, we, our next speaker is Charmaine Pereira, who is a feminist scholar activist living and working in Abuja, Nigeria. Her research and writing addresses themes such as feminist thought and practice, the gender and sexual politics of violence, women organizing, and the state. She's edited the special issue, she edited the special issue number 22 of the Continental jo uh, Scholarly Journal Feminist Africa on the theme of feminist organizing, strategy, voice, and power. She's organized and coordinated action research on the theme of sexual harassment and sexual violence in un Nigerian universities with a, with a view to working on strategies for change. She is also the author of Gender in the Making of the Nigerian University System from 2007 and the editor of Changing Narratives of Sexuality, Contestations, Compliance and Women's Empowerment. Pereira has been an active force in the coalition pushing for the passage of the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act in 2015. Welcome. Charmaine, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, I started talking not realizing I was muted. Um, so thank you for the introduction and the invitation and thank you to everyone who has spoken so far. Um, there's really a lot to cover. Um, I, my starting point is that it's given the difficulty that um, survivors have of giving testimony, of speaking about their experiences, um, and recognizing that that difficulty stems from their clear recognition of the stigma that flows from giving testimony, as well as the dangers of victimization in the university once they have spoken about their experiences of sexual harassment, assault, um, violence, including rape. Um, we need to be able to broach the subject from different fronts. Uh, and this is what I'm going to try and do here. Um, and I, might, I also think that there is no um, singular starting point. Uh, I don't think we should approach the education system as if you can only make change by interventions um, at the uh, earlier end, you know, the primary or secondary school end, um, and that uh, operating at the higher education end is um, not going to make a difference. I think what needs to happen is we need to have a broad front of people working in coalitions within and outside the institution in order to bring about change because institutions um, are always located somewhere and their context shapes and their context and relations with um, uh, spaces, other institutions um, and social relations beyond the academy have a bearing on what happens within. So um, I'm going to start with um, a particular vignette. Uh, at, a, at a public hearing organized by the Senate in February this year to discuss the proposed sexual harassment bill, the ASU national president, Diodun Ogunyemi, rejected the bill. He said that every university has structures through which disciplinary procedures are handled. If we follow the procedures that we have in place at the universities and we link with our existing laws, we can address the same problem without necessarily coming up with a law. On other occasions, he has argued that the bill undermines university autonomy and targets male lecturers unfairly. Now, my second vignette is on another front, a tweet thread by a law student, um, Lolia Etomi, on the 5th of September, presumably 2019, but the date is not clear stated that one day at the Nigerian Law School in Lagos, two senior lecturers, a man and a woman, told the hall full of over 1,000 students and other lecturers that law students should not report incidents of rape or sexual assault 
because, quote, it takes two to tango, unquote, as she put it. The woman lecturer reiterated this point, saying that we will not support you. Some of you ladies, your bare arms distract even me. You women are the ones tempting them, i.e. the male lecturers. And I give you these examples, I offer these examples as ones pointing to two discursive fronts on which sexism and sexual harassment are enacted in Nigerian academia today. Now, the first points to the use of um, university autonomy in a very particular way. I think ASU, faced with the uh, agitation around the sexual harassment bill, with the fact that by the time it reached the, um, it was passed by the Senate, it had 106 co-sponsors, um, had two opportunities, really. One was to acknowledge that there was a problem and to try and, and um, have, engage in a conversation, whether internally or externally. Um, and the other was to respond defensively. And this is what um, I think we're seeing. And it's a very particular use of this, the discourse of university autonomy. Okay, in, on the one hand, it is supposed to um, uh, engage with the fact that universities are supposed to be places where academic freedom can be exercised. And therefore, there should be some freedom from state restraint. Because if you look at the history of um, higher education uh, across the, um, in so many African contexts, um, beyond the period of initial um, nation building and the setting up of universities, universities lecturers were, were seen as, you know, people who had a particular national role to play. Um, but with um, structural adjustment and so on, the, uh, and state repression, they now had um, faced clamping down um, in many ways. And so, uh, academic, the discourse of academic freedom and university autonomy was taken up to refer to that kind of freedom. And here we see it being, whether or not there are, and my, my point here is whether or not there are existing laws and whether there are uh, institutional procedures, um, wh what university autonomy is being hailed as pointing to is freedom from responsibility. That is freedom of male lecturers from legal restraint because existing institutional procedures regarding sexual harassment are said to be working effectively, in inverted commas. We know they do not. Now, folded into this discourse of autonomy is the notion that male lecturers act exercise personal autonomy in the fulfillment of academic or um, intellectual duties um, to the extent that this happens in practice, yeah? And all of this simply erases the underpinning of any such autonomy by women's reproductive work and the burden of care, whether in the home or in the university. And we've seen, we've heard examples of, uh, you know, how that's, that ha plays out in practice. Um, uh, children, brought into the world by, universe, by couples, into, both intellectuals in the university, are seen as specifically the responsibility of their mothers, not their fathers when it comes to childcare, and doing the actual work of um, um, uh, producing living, um, uh, healthy, functioning human beings who can um, hopefully you know, live a livable life. The second vignette, points to a discourse, very harmful one, I should say, vilifying women students for their indecent dressing, in inverted commas, and asserting that it is women students' responsibility for sexual violations that they may face. Now, this not only represents the bargain with patriarchy that some established women lecturers make, but also the elision of male responsibility 
for their own sexually coercive and violent behavior, all the while propagating disciplinary content and practice as lawyers. This is what they're teaching their students, yeah? Uh, propagating this kind of practice that undermines the pursuit of justice. Now, um, uh, I think when, I think there's a lot of work that can be done in sort of in unraveling the different threads in these kinds of discourses that are drawn upon the issues of gender, sexuality, power, class as well that are implicated and overlaid onto these discourses which address sexism and sexual harassment in Nigerian academia directly. And this is not to forget that uh, it's not specific to Nigeria. We, we know it's a global phenomenon. But the two vignettes I gave, um, I referred to are specifically about Nigeria. There are also material conditions of resource constraint, which it is important to highlight. And these include overcrowding, lack of basic amenities to a shocking degree, lack of electricity, lack of water, um, uh, lack of accommodation. And th these are the fallout from the massification of higher education. I, I, that is the idea that edu, edu, um, higher education should be, you know, um, increased in, um, in, 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 should be the uh, access to the services should be increased massively, but um, um, the actual resources for doing that were not, not being provided. So same number, number of staff, thousands of, of hundreds and possibly a thousand students in one's lecture. No increased um, physical uh, um, resources to accompany that. So this is the fallout from massification as well as commercialization of higher education that took place in the wake of SAP, structural adjustment in the mid 1980s. So um, women students, um, this is a particular example, but it's not only women students who are, um, uh, are exposed in this regard. In their efforts to secure access to such spaces are operating in a highly risky and insecure environment. And that's um, insecure for everybody, really. Um, in basic institutional processes, such as the recruitment of staff, the enrollment of students, the admissions process, the search for accommodation, the learning environment, the examination process, and so on. All of these provide different sites, spaces, and opportunities for corruption and mismanagement. We've seen that. And at the same time, um, involve multiple actors who prey on women, um, P-R-E-Y, um, particularly students, but not only students. So it could be junior teaching staff, non-academic staff. Abosede gave us the example of you know, visiting lecturers and so on. The actors, the perpetrators, uh, are not only lecturers, but also male students, non-academic staff, porters, security personnel, transport providers, and the like. Um, and I know this um, because of ac action research that uh, um, I coordinated when the Initiative for Women's Studies in Nigeria existed and we got some funds to do um, research on sexual harassment and sexual violence in uh, the academy and we very quickly found that if you focus directly on issues of violence, um, particularly sexual harassment uh, and the like, um, you don't, it's difficult to get people to speak about their experiences precisely because of what I mentioned at the start, stigma, victimization. The fact that um, many of the lecturers work together in rings to support one another um, uh, when, if, there's any danger of any of them being exposed. So what we are faced with is a, um, a university system. Um, I'm just rounding up now. 
in which sexism and sexual harassment are systemic and embedded in, the, in Nigerian higher education as it operates on a daily basis. And within this system, the institutional cultures of universities are marked by complex, multi-layered and varying configurations of power, not only gender and sexuality, but also class, as well as um, ethnicity and religion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charmaine, um, for your contribution. Okay, so for our final speaker, we have Dr. Yetende Zaid from the University of Lagos. So Dr. Zaid is a university librarian at Unilag. She has over 18 years of professional practice of managing information services to both students and faculty of the university. She's currently the secretary of the Lagos Studies Association. Dr. Zaid's interests include information service structures, information retrieval, information literacy, and knowledge management. Her works have appeared in leading local and international journals of library and information studies. Thank you, Dr. Zaid. Oh, sorry. Thank you, moderator, for the <laughs> thank you, moderator, for the introduction. I'm happy, I'm happy to be in this space this afternoon. The question of sexual harassment is antithetical to the academia, especially in the citadel of learning, which is supposed to embody a duty of care in line with the time-tested ethics of the teaching profession. In Nigeria, it's actually been said by various speakers that in Nigeria, the high rate of sexual harassment in tertiary institutions have persistently been in the news, and it is no doubt undermining the integrity of the academic system. Let me cite examples of our, at least four celebrated cases in Nigeria. The first was the sex for great between a postgraduate student and a professor of management accounting at the Obafemi Awu Lower University. It was highly celebrated. The second was the, sec the BBC reported case of sex for admission was between a journalist who was posing as a prospective student and a lecturer at the University of Lagos. The third was the, was the Barua case. This was a case of sex for admission between a prospective student and a part-time lecturer. It was a part-time lecturer at the University of Lagos. The fourth and most recent case, which um, Lola Conde mentioned earlier, was the case of sex for grades between a student and the head of department, the head of department at the Imo State University, Oweri. Female victims of the mentioned cases are not blameworthy for their attitudes, for their dressing and willingness to be in an uncompromising place with their violators. In Nigeria, really, we live in a transactional society where most people will approach, you approach them for help or favor, will in most cases ask for something in return. <laughs> if they don't ask immediately, they will certainly ask later. From a close observation of the mentioned cases that uh, I mentioned and other speakers have earlier mentioned, which happened on university campuses, one can say clearly that the pollution of the, of the university system is a fundamental reason for the anomalies. And I believe that this roundtable discussion will amplify deeper conversation as sexual harassment goes beyond female students and lecturers' narratives. It is something more systemic. If we take a deep audit of practices that goes on in the faculties and the departments, it is uh, something more systemic. But my concern is why such an evidently rampant crime is so underreported. Sunday, it's underreported. In my opinion, and as other people have mentioned earlier today, reasons for underreporting cases of such cases include, but not limited to, the um, power differential between victims and perpetrators, who will be afraid of what will happen if I report the case. Okay, I may face the consequences not just with my lecturer, but uh, 
his friends who may want to take it out on me. Then the lack of trust in the justice system. And the third to me is ignorance. As victims may not even know what constitutes sexual harassment in the first place. And so, um, but good enough. The issue is receiving attention, as Celia mentioned by so previous speakers in Nigeria, um, as uh, university staff policies against sexual harassment. I must confess that at the University of Lagos, the policy document is not just a policy document, it's not just a sexual harassment document. It is something that is well thought out and it is well followed. As um, some of the cases that I've mentioned that happened at the University of Lagos, the case of the Barua, who is currently serving a 21-year imprisonment, started off at the University of Lagos. Committees were set up. Things were properly followed. Then the case of the reported uh, BBC journalist that was reported, the violators was immediately suspended. So there's already a system in place. So the policy documents is something that is referenced and that has been structured. But uh, good enough, not just the institution have their own various structures. The government has further, their voter, voter brought the issue to the front burner, which I see as, uh, as good signals of well implemented. I will stop for now so that uh, this conversation can be very well, well, well interactive and we can take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Zaid, for um, your brief comments in this sense. So we only have about 20 minutes left, and this means that everybody who wants to speak will not be able to speak. I encourage all those who have comments and questions to also use the chat box. We will collect and save these comments so that even if we can't get to them this week, next week we can also talk about them in our next session when we talk about what can be done. So I would ask that anybody who has a comment or a question should please keep it brief and use the um, hand raise function. You can see it under participants or chat. Please raise your, your hand and I will collect the first round of questions for our speakers. Okay, so I see one physical hand raised. Would anybody else like to comment? I'm going to collect a few. Okay, I see two, three, four. Okay, so we'll, we'll say four comments. And please, um, as you unmute yourself, please remember that um, we only have a little bit of time left and I hope that you have a question for our panelists. Okay, so first we have Abiola Odejide to speak. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm speaking as one who was in the university from the 60s as a student. I knew what the culture was. And then I taught in the system for 30 something years before I retired. One thing I must say is that first, as a professor Okuma said, it is not, you know, the sexual harassment and so on is not culturally sanctioned, at least in the part of Nigeria where I come from. In fact, it becomes a family, the, the whole family is stigmatized for doing that kind of thing. It's not a question of they don't know, they do know what they're doing. Secondly, I want to make the point that the university is supposed to be a liberatory space, but people are, you know, there's a lot of academic bullying not only for, um, you know, just generally. And so this highly authoritarian hierarchical system makes it difficult. Now, the institutional culture is important. I was involved with the policy, gender policy and sexual harassment policy for the University of Ibadan. And I know how much work went into it because we wanted to build it from the bottom up. But I know what the problems are. There's a difference between having a policy and making it work. There must be the institutional will to make it work. You must put resources in place. It isn't enough to set up committees when things happen. What happens to the committees? The point has been made. I think Dr. Okomi, Professor Okomi has made, you know, a very, a very valid points about this. Then there's the question of um, under-resourcing of this uh, you know, 
of, this, of the units that are set up. If you don't give them money, no staffing, nothing, and then, but you show a paper to, to say that, oh, you do have a policy because it's good for the university. You know, when people are applying for grants and so on, they say, do you have an institutional policy on gender? Oh, yes, we do have one. You show that up, but that's not enough. There must be the resources to make these things work and also create a space because the male uh, staff tend to have safe spaces for perpetuating all these things. And it's like, you know, it's the, the support one another. So even if a student complains, it may not be the, the person who victimized, who is going to penalize the student. It's, it's somebody else in the system who is going to do it. Unfortunately for us too, there are female lecturers and administrators who don't buy into this system. And we must, uh, it's important to, to raise awareness among them, you know, so that they know that we have to work together to make these things work. Um, the, in, in some halls of residence, you know, the female students are victimized. Laws that apply in the female halls don't apply in the male halls. And so it's, it's important for us to, to build trust in the system. I, the, the sexual harassment bill that was passed and something, I looked at it and, you know, it had things like, if you wink at the student, if you wink, how do you prove that? You know, a wink is just a momentary thing. How do you prove, prove that kind of thing? It's important that we have an institutional culture that is committed to uh, eradicating um, sexual harassment and sexism on campus, no academic bullying, and no, um, don't allow transactional sex or anything like that because unfortunately, some female students also buy into that and some staff too, female students buy into that too. That the, the way to rise in the system is, is, to, is to play this kind of game. So women must not be regarded as intruders into the, into the academy. They have to own their space and to speak up. But it's important that the institutional structure has to be strong and the management have to be committed to it. Uh, it's instructive that on this panel, we didn't get any man to speak. How come? You know, because they too, we have, the men and the women have to work together. I've been asked, uh, you know, a couple of times, um, they said, we women's groups are concentrating so much on the female students that we are leaving the boys behind. And the boys are now underperforming academically and so on. And I say, you men to get together and, you know, do if you if you are committed to this do what needs to be done i don't want to take too much space but the, you, the distrust in the system makes it difficult you know to to get things working thank you thank you for your comments so we have three more and i ask very um, respectfully that people keep their comments concise so that our speakers can also respond so we have professor yeomi and then we'll have two more comments You're muted. We can't hear you, Prof. You have to unmute yourself or we'll move to the next speaker. Okay, hi. You can hear me now? Yes, uh, I, I really appreciate all the people who put the work into organizing these sessions and it's the amount of work and, 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 and enlightenment that was provided this morning, I mean, has given us a lot to think about. I won't say too much, but I, I'm just, I just feel compelled to speak to this issue that uh, Professor Kome has eloquently spoken to it. And 
Professor George too, talked about a broader culture of impunity. I think it is highly mistaken and a terrible thing for us to think that predatory sexual behavior is part of our culture. And I'm speaking up about this right now because I think that that kind of stance is also an impediment to addressing the issue. It, it also encourages perpetrators. There's nothing cultural about oppression. Of course, these are cultures of impunity and we have to recognize it as such. So let us banish this idea that it is our culture, period. And once we do that, I think we'll be able to move forward on a lot of fronts. I don't want to take any more time, but thank you for giving me this opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Our next comment slash question comes from Abby Ak. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? All right. Um, thank you very much. I'm actually Abiola Akiyade. Um, I want to also join others to uh, congratulate uh, those who have spoken on this issue. This is quite um, a good uh, program and quite enlightening. Um, when I, I want to speak about, um, I want to commend uh, all the speakers, particularly uh, Professor Kome and uh, uh, Professor Charmaine on their uh, suggestions and uh, this discussion. I think that we need to have a very holistic approach to addressing uh, the issue of sexual harassment in schools. Uh, there are issues that has to do with system, the system which is very weak, the structure which is very hierarchical, and the institution itself which is resisting the kind of change that is desirable you know, at this point in time. Somebody has talked about the issue of political will. We can't shift if the school institution do not have the will you know, to uh, ensure that we address uh, sexual harassment. And that's why we see that in a school like University of Lagos, despite the, um, the policy, and of course in IFE and all, all of the other places, the sexual harassment uh, and, um, uh, um, um, that were reported actually came after even the policies were made in those schools, including the University of Ibadan and all that. So there is, a, there is an issue of the will and the resources which somebody had made. There's also a need to uh, look at preventive measures you know, so that we invest also in creating awareness so that people also have an understanding of what sexual harassment really means. Response system, creating a safe space, safe educational institution. And we must be able to link um, this, uh, the, the creating that safe um, educational institution with academic growth. They, 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 they both work hand in hand. And until when the school sees that from that very holistic perspective, uh, perspective, it might be very difficult. Uh, uh, Professor Chamin had talked about the gaps that exist, the gaps in accommodation, in examination, uh, in a whole lot of ad administration and, and all of that. We need to work around ensuring that we close those gaps before we can completely have zero, zero tolerance to sexual harassment in school. I, I want to further congratulate everyone for uh, making this happen. Thank you so much. So our next comment slash question comes from Soma Dossi. I'm sorry if I'm saying that incorrectly. Okay. Um, greetings, everyone. Hello. We can hear you. Greetings, everyone. Mm, I have a question for Professor Okome. Actually, I heard her twice say something about women taking back their power. Oh, mom, please, may I know the power you made mention of and how can our female academics and students take back their power in our universities? That's the only question I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We also have one more question and I'll ask that you be brief. Oju, can you please ask your question, please? You're muted. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Ask your question, please. Oju, we can't hear you. You're still muted. Okay, so maybe we'll, we'll come back to you then. 
Okay. Um, would any of the panelists like to respond to any of the comments or the questions while we get um, feedback from Oju, while we wait? Yes, Dr. Okome. Okay. So when I talked about taking back power, I actually went to great lengths to um, explain what I meant to uh, the person. You know, the power to be equal citizens of universities is what I mean. And the power to walk around without being um, harassed, without being molested, without being assaulted by anybody. And how do people do this? You have to form coalitions. Those coalitions must be students, uh, faculty, I mean, lecturers, the staff, administrators, and then also there are NGOs that are working on these issues. And I dare say that uh, Dr. Abiola Akiyode's uh, NGO, WODSI, has been behind defending a lot of these uh, women that have come forward. They stood by them, they advocated for them, they ensured that there was justice. And also coalitions of women's organizations, Nigerian women's organizations are fighting. And that's why you saw the Senate passing the bill not just because of the embarrassment. There was a lot of organizing that went behind that to force the hand of the legislators. You know, so I, I, uh, coalitions inside the university that also link up with the outside efforts. It's a long-term effort because a lot of this impunity, behavior of impunity has been allowed to, 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 to permeate and to settle and to kind of occupy the space so that, you know, there's no commitment to change. But it is not impossible, you know. Um, yes, we have policies, we have laws. The thing is, are they going to be implemented or enforced? What kind of investigative um, capacity do these uh, institutions have? We've heard about poor resource um, capacity, but you know, if there's the inside and inside the university town and gown kind of coalitions, this thing, the back of the sexual harassment and sexual assault and impunity can be broken. So I have faith and I have worked, I have worked with people like uh, Dr. Afolabi and we are getting results, you know, so it's not impossible. Thank you for your response. Would anybody else on the panel like to um, either respond to the earlier comments or should I move to the next question? Yes, I want to respond, please. Okay. Yes. Um, a lot of people have spoken about the idea of uh, we should banish the idea that our culture, the African culture, the culture in Nigeria sanctions sexual harassment or sexism. Well, what I want to say is this. I did not use the word sanction. And it is wrong to help anybody to think or to even suggest that it is possible for any culture to sanction sexual harassment. I don't think there's any, there's, that there has ever been any such culture. What I mentioned and what I used specifically was permissiveness. And if I understand what that word means, it means that, I mean, there's a tendency for some people, for men, to enjoy excessive freedom of behavior. Now, I give an example. I was in, in, in a colleague's office one day, and I met a man with him, and he introduced the man as his friend. And the man was telling my colleague that he wanted to join the academia, but he was skeptical because uh, this idea of perish, uh, publish or perish, he's not sure that he might be able to cope with it. And my colleague in my presence was telling his friend that he, you know, he used so many ways, he, you know, spoke in different ways to encourage him. And one of the things he said that was interesting was that, you know, if you become an academic, you will have the freedom to sleep with any girl you like. No, so these are the kind of things I am talking about. In some parts of Asia, I'm, I'm aware that if you are raped, members of your family will kill you. They call it honor killing. Is this, is this, is this, is this, is this not true? Is, it, is this false? Is this, is this untrue? Now, how do we explain this kind of practice? Is it true or is it not true that if Somebody, if a woman loses her husband, the family encourages the brother, whether younger brother or elder brother, to make sexual advances to this woman. 
And if she refuses, there's a way she's looked at in the family as not cooperative, you know, as unreasonable. Is this true? So we can look at so many aspects of the way we behave, the way the things we do. What is culture? The way we, our way of life. And we are saying that it is time for us to engage one another, to engage the men and to let them know things they are doing that are not good. That it is possible for a man to stereotype, to discriminate, to show prejudice, even without being aware of it, which could be termed as sexism. So I have not said, and I, I can never say, that the African culture sanctions sexual assault or sexual harassment. But I'm saying that there are aspects of this, the way we live, that we can look at and see how we can engage the men and how we can constantly let them know that some of these things are wrong and these are the implications of what they do. And in the ways in which some of these uh, ways of behavior encourage or promote you know, sexual harassment. That's what I said, that's what I said. Thank you, Dr. Conde. Would any of our panelists like to have a final thought since we're basically out of time? Thank you. I'd like to have a final thought. Um, I love, I want to amplify the things that have already been said by fellow panelists about, um, about resisting, you know, there are ways in which people can talk themselves out of dealing with the problem, right? So the idea that this thing, X must be in place before sexual harassment can be dealt with. Institutions must be in place before sexual harassment can be dealt with. Um, you know, the culture needs to be changed before sexual harassment can be dealt with. I, I really feel like that's a, a, self, a, a, a pessimistic and negating uh, mindset. And also that all of these, these challenges, the challenges of physical, institutional resources, financial resources, and the challenges of unethical practices by our people who are supposed to be professionals, who are supposed to be teachers, who are supposed to be exemplars. All, ad addressing all of those planks can happen simultaneously. It's not a matter of waiting for you know, the lecture halls to be big enough or for you know, the student accommodations to be what, spacious enough, for the women's toilets to be you know, functional enough, for us to also be able to, um, to mobilize a, a, a pointed critique and stay focused on holding accountable, um, holding accountable vi vi those individuals who are violating what is basically a contract, a social contract that's supposed to be in place in these institutions between colleagues, between colleagues and students, between staff. It's a, it's a, it's a contract, it is a culture that we've all agreed to. And those who are perpetrators are violating the entire contract. And we should be able to call that out and um, without needing all you know without needing all of the other material um uh you know complications to also be in place at the same time that's that's really all i want to say is that it's an ongoing it's an ongoing and simultaneous struggle Thank you, Dr. George. So before we end, I know we're out of time. I wanted to draw everyone's attention to the questions that are in the chat that actually position us quite nicely for our conversation next week. Um, people like Helen and Al Alolade and others have pointed to what can we do? How can we help people who want to speak up, want to report, who want support? Next week at the same time, 3 p.m. Nigeria time, 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Um, Pacific time, we'll be talking about our panel will reconvene for the next topic sexism and sexual harassment, what can be done? And I encourage everyone to please attend and come and contribute. And I hope that next time we'll also have more time for comments. I want to do a special thank you to all our panelists. Thank you for coming today and speaking and sharing your thoughts and your wisdom and everything with us. We really appreciate it on this very difficult topic. And of course, thank you to uh, participants, everyone, who attended, who participated, who maybe was not able to contribute today, but maybe next time and in other venues can also contribute. Thank you to everyone at LSA who is here. And I hope to see you all next week when we reconvene for our second session. Thank you all and have a wonderful weekend.
Thank you. Bye. Of course, thank you to our president for also organizing this. Yes, Where, are Where are you? Where are you? The president is hiding. He is. I don't see him.